be good here. All righty, folks, got a really exciting event for you. Really honored to have Kieran Gilmurray here. He is a digital transformation technologist, expert in intelligent automation and RPA, among other things. So, Kieran, if you want to just kick it off, give folks a background on who you are and how you got into this space of all this amazing digital technology. Yes, look, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to do to meet everyone tonight and to interview. Uh, really exciting space. I love what technology can do, Jason. Not technology itself. I never get excited by that, if that makes sense. Otherwise, you start putting in tech solutions for the sake of tech solutions. So I've sort of sat for about the last 27, 28 years between the business and technology teams translating uh, business requirements into technology and technology requirements into business. Super fun space. I think I built my first robot in the year 2000, which uh, wasn't when I started IT. It was many years before that as well. <laughs> I'm not a billionaire, unfortunately, like the, the other chaps and chap S's who've done amazingly well in this space. But I am absolutely adamant that technology can make our working lives a heck of a lot more interesting uh, if it takes away a lot of the mundane, repetitive stuff. I'm absolutely a fan of uh, customers getting amazing experience that have been facilitated by technology. And I'm a total fan of businesses driving employment and gaining tremendous success, which hopefully creates more jobs. And so uh, that money uh, that's created through those jobs supports more families than anything else. So really love the space, love the fact it changes all the time, have had tons of fun and uh, intend to stay in the space for quite some time. Yeah, wonderful. And, you know, one thing that we're going to get onto is a quote that you you really you said in your article that we'll talk about, which is really important is kind of like the balance between the, you know, the human element versus the digital element, which is which is really key people going forward. So sure. for folks here that don't know, uh, Karen put he he's a prolific writer. He has over 120 articles on his on his LinkedIn profile alone. So that's really good stuff. A lot of uh, the RPA community turned to him for awesome uh, information. And the inspiration behind what we're talking about today is intelligent automation, top mistakes and misconceptions. He's put out an article and covers seven main points. So before we get to these juicy points, if you could clear up this whole thing, you know, intelligent automation, what is it? Why should organizations even care about such a thing? So I'll turn it to you, Karen, for that. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting phrase. And I say interesting because I, I, I think some people know what it means, some people don't. I think at times I don't know what it means, to be absolutely honest, Jason, because various vendors have bandied it around to mean a thousand and one things. And sometimes a lot jump on the latest phrase. So AI was one of those. You know, everybody was an AI company at one stage. Let me give you my definition, because I think as an industry, we need to simplify this for the audience. Otherwise, Whilst we're so busy creating hyper automation or super automation or automation on steroids or whatever the heck it's actually called, all we're actually doing is confusing an audience who really don't care what type of automation it is. They just darn well want automation and they want the automation to work, if that makes sense. So for me, I think uh, in automation, you're attempting to recreate what people do. And for me, I divide that up into numbers of areas. So, for example, you know, I call it the clickety click, which is very much the typing and the finger work where we're inputting or moving data. Mm -hmm. The other bit is the seeing part, you know, using OCR, optical character recognition to read in data. The other one is making decisions using a brain based on particular variables or data or information that we've got and maybe additional sources of information that we've got in. The other bit is listening, you know, when talking, which is the NLP pieces, the chatbot pieces and everything else. All of the technologies that you combine together to create or attempt to recreate human skills to allow uh, robots, digital workers, technology or algorithms to do the work that people are doing, the more you can replicate higher cognitive or human skill sets, the more intelligent the automation that you're getting. The real skill is recognizing when to put the technology in, and when to put a person in. And that's something that you mentioned a moment ago that will come to and it's a really important topic. But the higher uh, facilities of a person that you can replicate in a really effective way, that's intelligent automation, as intelligent as an algorithm can be, if that makes sense as well. Yeah, so what, what I'm getting at, it's something that we always look at is that this, this intelligent automation, it's such a, a loaded term and really it's just a suite of tools that are helpful to 
complete tasks. Maybe it's a visual task. Maybe it's a clickety click, like you said. So that's really interesting. So let's not get caught up in this jargon. And I think that's kind of brings us to your first point. There's a lot of confusion on what intelligent automation really is. So, I, you know, from, from our perspective, it's probably a combination of the, the fancy marketing language between AI and machine learning and cognitive technology. So, like, so a business looking at this, looking to you to say, okay, well, you're consulting us and our RPA strategy or our whatever tool they need for their business. How would you recommend that they would clear up this marketing mud that we're seeing right now? Yeah, to be honest, I would say, actually say ignore the marketing mud and start slightly differently. So for a business to exist, it has to deliver value to its customers uh, and those customers have to be willing to pay for that value. And that value that they're delivering has to be in excess of cost. And what I'm actually getting at, Jason, here is what's the business strategy? Uh, that's the first thing companies need to start with. They cannot, should not, must not start with the technology and then basically use it to hammer everything that they've got or hammer that technology into the business processes. Otherwise, in a crazy circumstance, if you're an insurance broker or insurance company, and someone's got a claim, you'll try and put a chatbot in to deal with, with that customer when they've had an accident. And that's one of those instances that I call the key moment of truth in a customer journey where any customer will judge you as a company and judge your service. I'm at my gr greatest need and you're getting me to talk to a dumb chatbot that probably doesn't understand human empathy and can't deal with me in a really compassionate manner when I may be very, very upset. So obviously start with the business strategy. What are you trying to deliver? And then work back from that, i.e. work back from the customer. How am I going to deliver it? What are the channels? Is it digital? Is it with a person? Is it a mixture or a hybrid where a really talented business person, she's been augmented really effectively with uh, the most amazing technology at the moment that helps her. So, for example, if a customer's ringing in the telephone line, I would want a very smart IVR to be asking that customer particular questions. I would want a smart web form being filled in as the customer automatically answers those questions. I would want data being pulled from all sorts of different and disparate data systems that I've got. I would want AI algorithms working to determine whether they owe money, they don't owe money. What is that they likely want? What's the best way of communicating and dealing with them? I would want additional information brought in from the outside, maybe credit scores or risk scores if I'm quoting them or renewing the insurance. And I would want to look at the next, next best action that I would want to take having dealt with the customer, leave that an upsell, a cross sell, or some other action. If I had all that presented and all that generated in front of me through the IVR, just as I'm dealing with the customer and I want to know when they've last phoned, whether they were complaining or not, that's technology working with me as a really skilled individual to start to deliver an amazing service. And I don't care what channel it come in, be it an IVR, a chatbot or whatever else, but when I'm dealing with you as a person, I want that at my fingertips. I want it really effective and I want it really visual. So start with the strategy, look at your customer journey maps, look at the key moments of truth for your organization when humans should do that, put a human in that place, augment them with great technology, and then look at the other opportunities where you can provide value 24 seven because we've reached what I would describe as that Amazonian age. Mm -hmm. I, it's not that Amazon's brilliant in everything, but they do the basics so darn well. They're available, great product supply, next best action, great returns policy, easy payment. Get the basics right because everybody now expects them. That is the de minimis that you can do. And then put other technology in at other moments where it's really valuable. So I'm, I will happily look at FAQs online at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. I will happily deal with an intelligent chatbot. I will happily buy online. I will happily do whatever. But when I want to talk to a person, I want that person there and I want them well trained. I want them highly informed. And as I do that customer journey mapping, that business strategy, and look to how we can augment, then I'm starting to pull together all of the technologies that I've got with one small caveat. That is, I try and find as few technologies as I can and put platforms in that provide a lot of different tools because it is a digital toolkit that you need to replicate human skills and all the mental and physical capacities that we got to intelligently automate. The why I do that is companies for years have brought this tool in and that tool in and someone in the department has bought something with the credit card and something else. 
that just ends up slowing organizations down because the change management, the patching, the security issues that all comes with that means you slow down and organizations can no longer afford to slow down. They have to move at pace in a very agile fashion. They have to create minimal viable product. And that's not to suggest they leave tech debt behind or documentation debt behind. But to be able to do that at pace, you need less, not more technology. Yeah. So, you know, that whole thing, that last bit, you know, that there's almost, do you think that the technology is creating a stress to, we've got to use this because our competitors are using it. If we don't, we're going to fall behind because they, they at one sense, they do need to use it. But at another sense, going back to the principal core business, right? Provide value. It's like, it seems like they're putting technology first and not putting themselves, you know, that customer that's calling the business when they want to talk to a human being, there's nothing more frustrating if you need like something d- dealing with an account and like you hear the bot and you're going through a prompt and you say all this information and then you repeat the information to another bot and that handoff, like that's when it kind of breaks down and you can't repair a bad business model with great technology. You, you cannot, but it's amazing, Jason, how many people turn around and use this horrendous phrase that makes me cringe every time I'm, I, I see it. But surely there's technology answer for that. And usually it's people problems. It's siloed thinking. It's a broken culture. It's poor processes. It's processes that are never designed for digital. If you lead with the technology, you're in trouble. And this is the bit where I think we can do far better as an industry, because I hear, you know, automation first mindset. Well, hold on, then that might imply digitize everything. But do you really want to be told by a robot that your cancer scan has proven particularly true? Or would you rather an empathetic nurse or doctor, or whatever else that, that's doing that? You know, do you really want to replace everyone with technology? Because, you know, you can't replace brilliant human intuition, ingenuity, innovation, all those things, you know, with a, with a piece of technology. If you're telling your organization as well that, you know, computers are more important than the team or the colleagues or them, and you wonder why people are taking part in the great resignation, either that, you know, they fear technology or they're being replaced by technology for technology's sake, then please look in the mirror and wonder what the heck it is you're actually doing. So definitely, you know, don't have technology where technology can augment and add tremendous value to the customer, but start with the customer work back to the business, make sure that the colleague experience, in other words, if you have happy staff, very simple, simple, something, you know, happy staff who are using technology that makes their life so easy. In other words, don't put in something that looks great on paper, does a great technical job, but doesn't have a great employee experience. Give them the tools and the authority and the training and the teamwork and the trust that they need to deliver a great customer experience and that, and give the customer a great experience, that will result in business profit. Any Anything else, technology first, digital first, or whatever else, without going through all of those uh, thoughts and feelings and emotions and teams and whatever else is just going to result in failure. Yeah, and that, that's the big point that, uh, of, if, for those that don't know, and a big point in Kieran's article is the wrong application of the technology. And I want to quote you on what you said here, because it's something that we value and a lot of RPA companies may not value it the same, but our position is what Kieran said is humans should be left to complete tasks where their unique skills are required, deep, deep in personal relationships, deliver impactful news. Like you're saying, the, the empathetic nurse delivering these uh, really difficult messages. And and in a lot of ways, this technology is built to enable, enable human workers to do higher quality work, not replace their work. And that's something that when I read that, I'm like, wow, we, we're, we're right in align with our position because that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a supplemental tool, not a replacement. You know? So that's something really, really big for organizations to consider moving forward. Yeah, so going, going back to another point. So software, you know, the software, the technology may not be the right fit for an organization. So Maybe pull out those situations where a company should not really just be trying to apply a technology when it's not a right fit for them. Yeah. So if if you look at all of the buzz bits that, that's been around for the last couple of years, you know, robots, number one, AI, number two, blockchain, number three, NFTs, metaverse are the big thing, artificial reality and virtual reality. Sometimes it's really hot topic wise. And therefore, what you get is the CFO goes down to the golf course, she plays golf with her friends, and the next minute comes back and say, 
we have to have a robot, we have to have blockchain, we have to have something <laughs> yeah. else. And you're sitting there going, you know, well, well, why? Well, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, our competitors have it, the market have it, you know, something else. And I, I sort of look at this and I, and I kind of cringe and I kind of worry, you know, tech for tech's sake has never, ever worked. You'll end up crowbarring it into your organization. And if you're trying to do that and you're not actually listening to your customers or your employees or your IT team, then everybody's going to passively or actively resist. And by passively, they'll do it because maybe this the boss insists on it. And you will hear those groans, oh my goodness, what's the latest technology that he or she or they are suggesting that we now need? Uh, it'll never work, but we're, we're just being asked to do it. You know, it, it goes back to that, what's the strategy? What's the great tool that will work and deliver those great experiences, the CX and the EX, and then doing that. So that I, I do see it. I do cringe. I do worry that people do it because it's hot, not because it's the most sensible thing to do. I wish it wouldn't happen because there's a tremendous amount of wasted time there's wasted uh, money, there's wasted resources, and there's a hell of a lot of wasted emotions as well inside of organizations and teams that generally every organization I've come across, with very few exceptions, everybody just wants to do a great job. And I want great tech and great training to allow me to do it. And if you give me that and trust me and devolve decision making to me, I'll actually do a great job for you. So I'd love to see that and a real focus on people and change management and putting in the right tech than just putting in tech because it's hot or what if someone has said that it's hot. Well, you're highlighting something really important is that there's a competing strategy within the organization, like the business goals themselves versus the tech goals that they have. And that's what's creating that, that friction between the organization. They're trying to reach something that maybe they're, maybe it's just there's a disconnect between the people that work there and then where the tech team is trying to go. It's just not really serving the, the actual business needs or vice versa. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make there. And sometimes this is this is a really spoken about and emphasized thing, how IT resists, how they don't understand the business. You know, that that's one element of the strand that I hear, or I hear the business aren't listening to their IT team or vice versa. We have to really dig behind that. And if we take a moment at it, if I'm a business professional, uh, quite often I won't understand technology to the degree that the technology team do. But I've seen lots of people going, well, look, I've got an I've got a you know an iPhone and therefore I want it connected to the corporate network just because, well, you stop giving me something else and stop telling me about security and blocking me doing this, that, and the other. I just want it to work. And then you run the risk of ignoring your IT team who do understand security. Or I want a robot, and you see robot programs starting underneath desks, and the next minute the person leaves the organization. And entire teams dependent upon it, and IT are expected to support something they've never actually heard about. So you see tremendous examples of both, or IT teams, let's be fair, introducing software, introducing systems, because on a piece of paper, technically, it's it's the right thing to do. (laughs) And I've introduced not two-factor authentication, I've introduced 52-factor authentication, because that's really secure. (laughs) The key (laughs) here is to recognize, look, there are different skills. And there are different wants and needs in every single department. And you hire specialists because you want to recognize their skill and you want to value it. And I think there needs to be more people like myself who are capable of actually translating between the business and the technology team so that both are allowed to get on and be as amazing as they are at each of their individual specialisms. But let's stop forcing one to be one thing and another to be another thing and creating a very polarized argument. And let's try and get those teams to come together. Now, that at times, Jason, might be a little bit idealistic because we've all come across the IT teams that say no. And just no matter what the business says, you know, about wanting to evolve responsibility, about wanting to develop their own code and their own robots and to get great software that helps them. We've heard it, you know. That IT team have to move. Uh, the business have to recognize that, look, there is a reason behind you know, data security and information security. There is a reason behind regulation that's driven down and usually driven outside of IT. There is something called scalability and the ability to support and onboard and change things and move quick. So we need to encourage and foster cooperation and conversations to allow those things to work together. So less about the divisiveness, more getting the people to work together and communicate effectively. And ultimately, if you can't change the people to do that, the old phrase is change the people, get a team who actually will. But both need to cooperate together to make a modern business successful because every business is or will become a technology business. 
Right. And that, that brings us to our next point. So one of the mistakes that companies make when they, when they do have great people is that they have a lack of technical training with the tools themselves. And that's something that you highlight often. So from your perspective, you, you know, you said about a while ago, you made your first spot in 20 years ago. So you have technical experience. I would call it, what is that? Is that a prehistoric bot? <laughs> but how, how important is it for the, getting the right training, whether it's RPA, whether it's uh, an IDP tool that uses OCR, to an organization to make time to get outside of their normal day-to-day, you know, their normal day-to-day tasks and make time to really learn technically how these tools work within their organization. How vital is that? Oh, it's, it's, it's just essential. I, I use this ex- explanation sometimes, Jason. Uh, you wouldn't hand me a Ferrari without any driving lessons. So in other words, something valuable and something key and something very rich and something capable of doing amazing things and say, okay, go on a journey. You know, you would train someone, you would educate them. You wouldn't put a claims handler in front of a claims process and say, oh, just work it out. But it's amazing <laughs> the numbers of times that we throw technology onto computer desktops and go, oh, you'll work it out. Do you know what I mean? It'll, it'll all be fine. And then you wonder why people aren't particularly productive or aren't working in a really efficient manner. You know, mine mine is very simple and, and it's maybe too simple, but it should be. You know, you bring in people who have the right aptitude and attitude for any role in the organization. You then give them the training and the toolkit, the mentorship, the guidance and the guidelines, the trust and the teamwork to allow them to do an amazing job and you devolve responsibility to them. It doesn't mean you're leaving them on their own or you don't have some element of structure, be it matrix or hierarchical or whatever else. And it doesn't mean that you don't give them goals and a mission or whatever else, but give people great tools, great training, great mentorship and great guidelines. And they will normally do amazing work and result in great innovation. The challenge for organizations these days is, as I mentioned a moment ago, all organizations are becoming technology businesses. If you're not teaching people how to use the key ingredient that's going to drive your organization to deliver using digital automation technology, then you cannot expect it to evolve and you cannot expect people to actually innovate. Now, I've, um, I was a massive fan for years of Google's 20% rule or whatever that was called. It was giving everybody a day a week to do amazing things. I would extend that. I would take 20% of your budget out every single year to innovate. And the innovation is tooling, it's training, it's making sure your executive teams are exposed to the latest tooling and technology, not to get them excited, they should be excited about it, but to go, okay, I'm well-informed, I'm well-educated, I know what I can do, I know how I can change my strategy to deliver doing this, that, and the other. But, But an executive team, we can't put all the pressure on them, expect them to be amazing. It's the people inside of the organization who are dealing with the customers every day, dealing with the processes, dealing with suppliers, So give them the tooling and the training and the time to innovate and to recreate. Because if an organization isn't evolving, then that phrase I used earlier on, digital Darwinism, will become true. Those that digitize and move forward at pace will survive. Those that don't will be like the dinosaurs. They will die out. And anything in between, i.e. using uh, digital technology to embalm existing horrible rubbish processes and making them digital to go faster won't work either. You have to innovate and recreate and redefine how you deliver value. And you can't expect people to work that out by themselves. You need the training, but the training isn't enough. You need the toolkit, the toolkit isn't enough, the trust, the teamwork, the mentorship and everything else, the change management, the guidance and all those ingredients come together to make that business cake that actually tastes good. Mm -hmm. Any absence of any of those ingredients you're going to end up with something rather bitter and untasty that you will want to throw in the bin and just won't work. Nice. You know, it just everything that you say just goes back to those business fundamentals. It doesn't matter how sexy or awesome the technology is, it's business fundamentals. And, you know, the, the final point that we're going to talk about is the prioritizing of the customer and employee experience with the technology, not putting the technology first, putting the customer's and the people that work for the organization. So speak a little bit about that, kind of bring us home on why that is going to be the driving force for the decisions for the technology that they use. Yeah, it goes back to that. If I always sort of said, uh, Jason, if I can improve three things that I've ever done in any organization over the years, it's communication, communication, and communication. Very often, you know, technology is thrown into the organization. Everybody's expected to work with it. 
and they end up taking longer. It's more miserable. The experience for the staff is horrendous. And guess what? Unhappy staff results usually in unhappy customers. So you have to engage your staff in the decision making process. You have to understand what they're actually doing and how they're delivering value. They have to understand what the customers want and what the market wants. So therefore, if you're not actively encouraging your staff or your business to listen to your customers, to watch where the market's going, to listen into you know, what they want, how they want served, then you're in trouble. So I, I sort of say, listen to your customers and that's a variety of things. You know, Watch what they're buying, watch where they're spending their money, watch key technology trends that are happening. So for example, I looked years ago at mobile phone technology because everybody's a mobile phone and guess what? Everybody was paying on the mobile phone and they were using IVR payments. Well, the first thing I did as an organization, this is 15 years ago, was introduce IVR payments into an insurance brokerage and immediately our debt percentages went down because it was a, pay a payment credit line. People didn't want to pay their money. They just were a bit embarrassed if they were a day or two late. So we managed to redirect, you know, out of a team of 10, five of the staff to do other valuable work because customers were able to pay their bills at whatever time of day or night using a phone IVR. They weren't embarrassed about actually owing money because they were good and honest people but they were able to clear their debt with minimal fuss using something that they were very familiar with in the technology market. If you look at what Amazon's teaching us, how to pay online, how to order online or whatever else, you can use great examples like that if you're a bank or something similar, an ordering group, to basically provide a similar kind of experience. But all the time, one of the most effective things I've done that goes back to business fundamentals, I used to introduce new processes because there was a process excellent technology lead years ago but before I did it I understood why we were delivering value how we were delivering value and I used to listen to a minimum of 10 or 15 customer calls every single week and I was an executive team of this organization but by goodness before we did something and we did something I listened to the colleagues who worked with me and I looked at the impact on the customer and we did customer surveys and we did customer sit-ins and we got video customers before we introduced anything that we did as a minimal viable product in a test bed. That way there, we could be sure that whatever we built, if it was torn apart in some of those listen back and feedback sessions, we fixed it. We brought it live to get value out as quickly as we could. And guess what? We continued to listen. Too often, Jason, people treat technology or digital or automation projects as a project. In other words, something time bound and time defined. Digital transformation, intelligent automation is a pursuit or an endeavor that constantly involves you iterating and inventing and listening and creating and building minimal viable products in a very iterative plan, do, check, act manner to allow you to constantly evolve, constantly innovate, constantly deliver value, constantly get the feedback that you need to make sure that you're providing a value and a service that customers are still willing to pay money for in excess of the cost that it creates you to build it. Wonderful. Yeah. C communication and customer, you know, it doesn't matter how advanced the technology gets. Those are just the fundamentals that are, you know, like you said, you, you were listening, you were a C-suite executive, you're listening to those customer, you know, 15 calls, you're listening to that and you're making decisions. I mean, that's just something that we can't get rid of because of the technology is good. So let's well, talk about- nor, nor should you. And that's yeah. the interesting bit because that's, that call listening was the most effective thing that I did. I actually took every complaint call in the business. Every single one come to me. And not, by goodness, do you want to stop those coming to your desktop? You know, that's that's where technology can really help. So I had, you know, a, a learning and development team who coach managers to find those calls. Then we introduced NLP technology that allowed us to automatically listen in for particular keywords and training opportunities and feedback sessions and then scored the call. So instead of a manager maybe getting to five calls a month, we're able to use technology really effectively to feedback on 50 plus calls a month. And if you can imagine getting that coaching and training and direction and guidance and best practice fed to you so often every single month, not to criticize, but to augment and improve your performance, that's amazing feedback that allowed our teams to be so much more successful. And that's a great example of using technology for the correct purpose not just putting technology in because someone said it was sexy at some point. Right. Getting right. that constant feedback. Well, tell we're running out of time, but let's talk really quick. So you have exciting news. So third Thursday, this expert digital transformation group, for those that don't know, it's been they're celebrate. You guys are celebrating your one year anniversary, correct? We just did with some yeah. of the best experts that this industry has got. It's recorded on our 
YouTube and LinkedIn channels. So go and look at the third Thursday on YouTube or LinkedIn and you will see nine to 11 of the best thinking minds in this industry answering questions. And that's what we do. Those folks joined us, myself and Emma Roloff, uh, every month on the third Thursday, hence the name. <laughs> and we talk about any area from di about digital transformation. That's everything from RPA to IA to machine learning. Uh, in the new year, we're talking about, you know, people and change and HR strategies and how to bring your teams with you. And then in February, we've already got lined up, you know, metaverse, NFTs, blockchain, Bitcoin and anything else. So all the emerging tech that really is, I describe it as practical tech, Jason, because these are real world practitioners. They're, they're not people trying to sell you something who have never used it. They've used this in the wild. They've seen all of the consequences, good and bad with the tech. And we have their availability for 30 of the fastest minutes of your life, but it's designed in such a way that you can take real action off these practitioners' expert advice the moment you step off that webinar. Beautiful. So anyone interested in intelligent automation should definitely follow Third Thursday. They're on YouTube, they're on LinkedIn. And then finally, Kieran, what is the best way that people can connect with you? You're on LinkedIn. What, what's the best way people can follow you and read your content? Yeah, uh, same thing. I'm on LinkedIn. As you said, I have about 130, 140 articles. I posted about 10 things this week, some of my own, some other information that I find best, best practice in the market for others. Uh, get me there. And then I also got a YouTube channel where I put my video interviews up so that if people want to watch those and keep hold of those, they can as well. I've also got my own website, uh, Gilmurray, G-I-L-M-U-R-R-A-Y.co.uk for anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about me as well. Beautiful. Well, it was such an honor to have you here and look forward to seeing big things from you and let's keep, keep open. And uh, a final message, this, this video of this meetup is sponsored by OpenBots. We are an RPA platform. We have a free trial. We have no licenses. So anyone interested in using responsibly an RPA technology to augment their business, go to openbots.io and check us out. We will see you next time.